My name is Pastor Ben. We're so glad that you've been able to make time in your schedule this evening to join us for our Coping with COVID seminar. And I'm going to open us with prayer, but I want to just tell you my heart for tonight is just to equip people to be able to notice when there are needs that are starting to arise because of all the layers of difficulty that we're seeing from being in the middle of a pandemic. And as I got to sit down and visit with our uh, speaker tonight, who I'll introduce in a moment, I just, my heart resonated with what he shared. And I have to give a lot of credit to our Minister of Sending and Equipping, Gina Ryan, and this was something that God led her to. She heard him speak and she responded. And, and to find that God was preparing Jonathan to share with us tonight was just a powerful affirmation for the need that there is this evening. And so uh, this is for you. Uh, there's going to be opportunities for you to interact with, uh, with Jonathan as well. And we just want you to know this is to empower you as a disciple of Christ to pay attention to your own heart and to the hearts of people you care about. And it's an aspect of discipleship that we see being able to care for each other in this way, an aspect of fellowship, an aspect of care. Uh, we're, we're called to pastor each other in these ways. And so looking forward to what God will do as, as we're here together. So let me pray and then I'll introduce Jonathan. Dear Lord, we sense your presence here. And Lord, at the same time, there might be anxieties, there might be uncertainties that we're sensing and feeling, and it's been hard to shake them because this seems to be getting worse in ways, and it seems to be prolonged in others. And Lord, it's starting to show things that uh, are causing us to feel out of balance and off kilter, and I don't know what other word we might use. But at the same time tonight, we know that we can trust completely in your sovereignty in your provision, in your love, in your care for each of us personally. And that's what we want to be reminded of tonight. We want to be uh, aware of the truth of your deep and abiding, caring love for us. So walk through tonight with us, whether we're watching online, Lord, or whether we're here in the room or in the room uh, next to us. Let us just be led by you and your spirit for your glory. So God, just uh, pray a blessing over Jonathan right now. I thank you for his heart for you in his heart to help people who are in need. And uh, God, just reveal to us more of who you are so we can understand better who you've made us to be. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jonathan Bush is a Christian counselor. Can I call you a therapist? <laughs> At Engage Christian Counseling. And uh, he's also an ordained minister within the Assembly of God Church. And uh, his heart for the Lord and his word, and for God's children, I mean, people in general, just, it, it speaks loudly, you're going to hear it, and I just want you to know the things about Jonathan that I've come to appreciate already in the, the few times I've gotten to, to have him uh, just fellowshipping with me. So, Jonathan, we'll just turn it over to you this next period of time, and uh, lead well, I know you will, God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Ben. Uh, just a, such a privilege to be here tonight. I just want everybody to take a deep breath of air, let it out, and uh, I hope tonight's informative, I hope it's enjoyable, I hope that it's challenging, I hope that it's insightful this evening. But to begin with, I'm just going to have everybody stand up, would you? So we've got to do one activity here to kind of get started with before we get into our substance we're going, just to kind of prep you for the evening. And we've got to do the, the obligatory opening song, okay? So I'm going to have them go to the next slide there up on the, on the PowerPoint. And uh, so, so we've got to do this to open up with, okay? And now, now here's the key. I mean, I need everybody to, I need, everybody pretty well knows this song. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty common song. Uh, probably goes back to your childhood. But I need everybody to sing it as loud and proud as you possibly can, okay? We're going to sing it twice, Okay? And your neighbor sitting next to you is going to report on you if you don't sing it loud, okay? In fact, I'm going to ask for who is the quietest singer, and I'm going to have them come up and sing it with me again, okay? So get ready. It doesn't matter what it sounds like. We're all going to sound horrible, okay? So just get ready here. I'm going to count down three, two, one. When I do that, let's make this a little more complicated. I'm going to have all the men sing the first verse, and I'm going to have all the women sing the second verse at the same time. 
Okay, so get ready now. Some of you are watching this online. I expect you to be standing in your living room, standing in your office, wherever you're at. I want you to get ready. I need you to do this there as well. I'll give you a second to stand up. Okay, so I'm going to count down three, two, one. Tell your neighbor. I better hear you. I'm more reporting you. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? Have you got it in your head? Here we go. Three, two, one. Stop, stop, stop. I won't make you do that. Sit down. Now, how many feel better already? Okay. Let, let me introduce myself. My name is Jonathan Bush. I'm privileged to have my wife Kathleen with me here tonight. We, uh, wife of 31 years, it's, great. it's been a great journey that we've been on together. Um, I am a licensed professional counselor uh, with the state of South Dakota. All that simply means is I've done some education and some supervision, some experience to be able to, to operate under that license. I work with Engage Counseling here in Mitchell. We have an office in, in Plankington and in Chamberlain as well. Uh, um, but in that process over the last 10 or 11 years, God has just, has just revealed so much to me um, regarding his plan and wanting people to be whole when it comes to mental health and emotions and relationships and behaviors and everything that flows out of that. And we'll get into that more this evening. Uh, 10 years ago, or I guess almost 13 years ago now, I was pastoring down in Nebraska and had pastored for about 18 years and uh, was dealing with a number of really significant issues, really in particular dealing with pastors and their families and in churches and conflict within churches. And we were running into issues that were just way over our head. Um, we just could not get to the bottom of it in conflict and in emotions. And, and we prayed and we fasted and we just kept running into these issues where, where we were seeing people not only leaving churches, but also even leaving faith. And I said, there's got to be another approach. Said, what we're doing is not working. The Lord led me back to grad school, back to a, a Christian a graduate college. And in that process, opened up my, my world as far as mental health from a Christian standpoint. And then in the last 10 years, God has just done remarkable things in helping me to understand his will uh, and his power for changing lives in the area of uh, mental health and emotions. So uh, we've got two sons, uh, 27 and 23. We were foster parents for about 10 years. We did, what, 18 come through our home, 17 came through our home. We adopted the last two little guys, and now those little guys aren't little anymore. They have grown up, and uh, they have been a, a powerful part of our home. I've been a Christ follower since the Nixon administration, <laughs> whenever that was, early 70s. My dad was a pastor and, and just impacted my life powerfully. I believe in Sunday night services. Tremendous things happen in my life in Sunday night services. Right over there at the left side of the platform in Mott, North Dakota, my dad's altar. I, I accepted Christ as my personal savior when I was four years old. And it's still impacting my life today. So I believe, I believe the power of, of the altar. I believe the power of... The, of uh, church in, in entire families' lives. So tonight I want to uh, just set, a, set the stage a little bit for where we want to go. We've got a kind of a diverse crowd here this evening. I know we're, we're live uh, streaming this as well, and it'll be recorded as well. There's lots of different uh, groups that are watching this, um, not only from the church context, but I know there's several different professional groups that are, are watching this as well. And we're going to try to throw a wide loop around some things tonight and uh, be able to give some, some help and some hope to, to a number of different groups. We are going to pass some note cards around here in a little bit, and we are going to uh, open it up for some questions you might have a little bit later. Uh, if, so, if you want to do that, we'll, we'll make that available here shortly. The biggest thing tonight, I guess my goal tonight, is to give some, give some context when it comes to dealing with behavioral issues coming out of mental health uh, concerns whether that's uh, depression, whether that's anxiety, whether that is a relational conflict, whether that is uh, a, a number of issues that we run into. Our, our, our mental health falls into so many different categories and impacts so many different categories in our lives. And tonight I want to try to give some context to that in, in what I've learned, uh, especially from the framework of the intersection of theology and psychology. Where does, where does God intersect this thing we call psychology or mental health? And I think it's a powerful place where those, where those two things touch. They're not mutually exclusive. They're not two different things. They're, they're meant to work hand in hand. God, is, um, God wants to know us intimately and wants to bring healing to our inner being and in a powerful way. And I believe God, God not only wants to, but he's able to do that as well. Tonight, we're also going to um, take a look at how our reactions in situations 
hamper our ability to really deal with conflict and to follow to really resolve conflict within our lives. We're going to touch that a little bit this evening. That's the piece where mental health uh, affects and, and intersects uh, other relationships around us. And then last tonight, I'm going to uh, really want to bring this down to a place where there's hope. We live in a time, we live in a year that I've seen so many funny pictures of 2020, memes that are out there that, what a crazy year this has been. Um, as I said a couple weeks ago when I was here introing this seminar, we, we live in a year of disruption. It's been disruption after disruption after disruption. And uh, we've just kind of gotten used to the fact that nothing's predictable. And we're seeing that in our own lives. It just, we're just, you just really can't bank on anything. You can't count on anything. And we tend to function best when we can know what's coming. When life is predictable, we tend to, we tend to function best. And tonight, I guess the, the, the ultimate goal for this evening is, is that no matter what is going on, no matter what is happening, you know what? There's always hope. There's always hope. Uh, I've been reading through the book of Philippians um, and, and just looking at Paul's life. You know, and this, this guy who was stoned, what, four times? I mean, he was shipwrecked in open sea. He was in jail. He, was, he, was, he took uh, the 40 lashes. I mean, this guy's been through everything. But something that is, that's full in his writings, that, that's replete through everything he's written, is, is there's always hope. There's always hope, and that hope is in Christ Jesus. Paul writes, I know who, I'm, who I believe, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. What a powerful statement. It's what Paul lived through, all those things. He lived through that. And tonight, at the, at the end of our time tonight, I guess my, my hope for this evening is, is that you leave here and say, there's hope here. This is not hopeless. We've got a world, we've got a media, we've got a society that is telling us that things are hopeless. They're not hopeless. Um, there, there's hope in this. But I believe our hope is really uh, founded in our, in our faith in, in Christ. So tonight I want to go back to this crazy little song we just did just a moment ago. And I want you to think about how you felt for a moment. Was there anybody getting a little nervous? Anyone? Would you admit that? Okay. Let me ask you this. That moment um, when, when you thought I was going to make you sing, um, did, did, could, would anybody admit that they could feel that tension in their body at all? Anyone? Boy, this is a really tough crowd this evening. We, uh... In my field, they, we call this avoidance and minimization is what we call this. <laughs> um, one of the reasons I did that is I wanted to just bring up to a, a point of stress or a point of conflict this evening. One of the most important things for, that I've learned in, in my study of, uh, in working with mental health is that, that our bodies tell us a lot. And God designed us this way. For us to, to be able to, to listen to our bodies, our body, when, our hung, when we're hungry, our, our body generally tells us. When we're tired, our body generally tells us. When we're even feeling under stress, our, our body generally tells us those things. So my question for you tonight, I want, to take, I want you to take a, a serious moment here, whether you're here tonight or you're listening online, I want you to take a serious moment. I want you to think about maybe that crazy song we did earlier or maybe another event that you're going through that is, is, is pretty stressful right now. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of pressure on you right now. Where do you feel that in your body? Just take a moment and think about that. So it might be stress in a relationship. Maybe it's stress at work. Maybe it's finance, issues along those lines, bills that are due. Maybe it's a health concern or a health issue. Maybe it's the, the, the COVID virus. I want you to think about that for a moment. And, and I want you to take an honest look at yourself. When you feel that, the weight of that, where do you feel that at? I usually feel it right here. Just a little off mid-center, I usually feel it right there in my chest. Most people that come into my office will tell me, I feel it low down in my belly, I feel it kind of high up in my belly, or right, right in the middle of my chest, or I feel it in my throat, or I feel it in my neck and shoulders. Most people will report they feel it somewhere in their core. Sometimes that people will feel extreme rage or anger in their hands or in their face, but for the most part, we tend to feel that stress right through our, right through our body. That's a gift from God. Our bodies tell us when we're starting to feel the weight of that. And the key is, is for us to, to be able to listen to that. 
the key is for us to be able to, to take and say, okay, I'm feeling this now. Well, what does that mean? We're going we're gonna to address that a little bit farther here in, 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 to, in a little bit. So I want to take a moment this evening, and I want to just maybe even just being in this place this evening, it's, it's feeling maybe like there's a little tension here. Maybe you're feeling even just being in a more closed setting, maybe there's a little stress this evening. I want to introduce a, uh, uh, an activity I do quite a bit in therapy. Um, has anybody ever done, when you were a kid, did you ever do the pat your head, rub your stomach thing, or pat your stomach, rub your head? How many can do that proficiently? Anyone? Anybody can do that proficiently? Who, did I see a hand back there? Renee Sand and show us. So clockwise on your head and pat your stomach. <laughs> now, <laughs> so, so I want to give you an activity that's similar to that, but, 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 but much easier to do. What happens when we're dealing with anxiety is, is that our brain, our brain begins to work. It begins to, to, to pound away. It, begin, it begins to try to solve problems. But nothing is ever accomplished. It, you just sit there and worry. In, in um, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that, look at the lilies of the field. You know, they don't worry about things. They don't worry about rain or sunlight. He says, seek first the kingdom of God. Let, let all these other things come into place. God will, God will bring those things into line. He says, don't worry. He was talking about anxiety. Uh, Paul in Philippians says, don't be anxious for anything. But in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. It says that the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Man, how many want that? Okay? So there's, a, there's some things we've got to do to be able to walk in that. For those that are here tonight that are, that are dealing with, with uh, stress in your life, that are dealing with heavy things, whether, whatever it might be really related to, those who are, who are listening online, you may be at home and listening, and there's just heavy things in your heart tonight. I want you to take a moment and just do this little activity with me. What I'd like you to do is, if you're at home, I want you to just get in a comfortable seat. If you're here, I just want you to kind of sit back in the chair and kind of just relax in the chair. I want you to put your hands on your knees if you're able to do that. And what I'd like to do is we're just going to do a, just a, a controlled breathing exercise tonight. This is just breathing 101. And uh, we're going to give you some rules I want you to follow. First rule is this. I want you, I want you to breathe in, the, breathe in the nose. I want you to breathe out the mouth. So smell the, can or smell the roses, blow the candles, okay? So breathe in the nose, out the mouth. Second thing I want you to do is I want you to breathe as deep as you and slow as you can. We call it belly breathing. I want you to just breathe in as deep as you can breathe in, and I want you to then I want you to hold it, and then I'm going to have you exhale till there's till everything is released from your lungs, and as slow as you can possibly do that. The trick is is that so it's not to whoop whoop whoop. It's not that fast. I want you to do this as slow as you possibly can. So the trick is is that. I want you to breathe in slow. I want you to hold it for the same amount of time you, you, as you breathed in. And then I want you to exhale as, as long as it took you to breathe out. So what we're going to do is we're just going to practice it here. Probably one of the more awkward things you did tonight after the whole home on the range thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to count backwards. Three, two, one. Then we're going to exhale. Then we're just going to breathe in really slow. We're going to hold it. And we're going to exhale. And that's one rotation. So here we go. Let's try this together. Three, two, one, exhale, breathe in. Two, three, four, hold it. Two, three, four, exhale. Two, three, four. Full disclosure, I cannot breathe and count at the same time. <laughs> I tried to master that, I've not gotten that one. So what I want you to do tonight, and we're gonna, we're gonna take just a moment here, and I'm gonna ask you just to do that, and I'm gonna add a couple more things. We're going to talk here in a little bit about how our, our emotions really are based in our, in our memories and are based in our senses. And so what I want you to do tonight is I want you to, as you're breathing, I want you to see if you can notice things around you, things that are here, things that are present. So I want you to notice what the chair feels like on your, on your legs, on your back. I want you to notice what the air temperature is. I want you to notice what the, the ambient sound or the lack of sound is in this room. Notice the lighting is maybe a little dim in here tonight. I want you to notice maybe something you smell or fragrance. I want you to see if you can bring your senses in while you're doing, while you're doing your breathing. Part of what we're doing is what Renee demonstrated is we're going to make the brain so busy 
then he can't worry. Okay, we're going to task it with, chore, with a chore that is here and now that is present. The last thing, and this is probably one of the most important things, is we tend to see what we are looking for. Okay? So if we, are gonna, if we want to see stress, if we want to see anxiety, if we want to see what that feels like in our body, we're, we're going to see that. That's what we're going to focus on. But if we're willing to, while we're doing the breathing, if we're willing to look for relaxation, you'll see it. And maybe relaxation is too big of a word. Maybe we need to just say uh, just a reduction in the stress, that feeling in your body. But see if you can see that there's a change. I've, I've never had this fail. All, all the clients that have been, fail, have been honest with me, never seen this fail. They will see some shift in their body. So if you're willing to try this with me tonight, we're going to try it again. And we're going to do two or three round rotations here. And I want you to just forget about the people around you. Forget about whoever's sitting next to you on the couch at home. Forget about your dog laying on your lap. Whatever might be going on there. I want you to just walk in and I want you just to try this breathing. Okay? Deep and slow. I want you to count like I did just a little bit ago. One, two, three, four. Hold it. Two, three, four. Exhale. Two, three, four. Just nice and slow. We're just going to take a moment tonight. I want to just see if you can experience that, just that physiological change in your body this evening. Okay? Just see if you can notice a change that takes place. And then we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. So let's take a moment. Let's just do that. We're going to take two or three minutes here. Let's just do, do that breathing. So deep breath in. Two, three, four, hold it. While you're doing that, just notice what your body feels like. Just be very deliberate. Just force your mind into the process. Nice deep breaths. Just see if you can notice a change in where you normally feel stress. Maybe it's somewhere else. You see you'll feel a relaxing or a softening or a release. Just do one more rotation. Just do one more, one more round. Okay, so how many here felt a change somewhere physically? Anybody? Okay, a few people. We're, in a, we're, in a, we're, we're doing this in a setting we normally don't do this in, right? Very, uh, very seldom would, did you do this on Sunday morning here. Um, but here's the thing. You know, God created these bodies. So many times we, we try to separate out John 3.16 away from, from our daily experience. You know, God created us. He knows, he knows what we feel like when we're under stress. I mean, Jesus in the garden, I mean, he, he sweat blood. I mean, that, that's pretty serious stress. He, he understands what we, we're going through. There's not a, they're, they're not two separate things. So tonight, even this little process, um, as, as corny as it may sound, it's a really powerful tool that when your mind is pounding away with worry, and you can't do Matthew, or you can't do Philippians. You can't walk through those promises. This is a tangible thing that can get you there. Maybe you're laying in bed at night and you just can't shut your mind down. This is one of those things you do. You take control of that. And, and you put your mind to work. And then while you're doing that, when you feel that, that relaxation come in, then you go to your scripture. Then you go to your promises and you, you bring them in and you, you allow yourself to, 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 to be resourced by that. But tonight, I want to encourage you that there's, that there's a process here. God understands what we're going through. Um, but for us, we need to understand with our body, where do you feel that at in your body? It's a first step, I think, in understanding what's going on. Another step is, is how, how strong do we feel that? If you're dealing with people, maybe you're a caretaker here tonight or, may, or listening online, and you're working with somebody who just, their anxiety is just so wound up. 
Uh, a really good question is, is where do you feel that in your body? What's going on? How do you know that you're stressed out? A lot of people tell me, man, I am so stressed out. And I say, well, how do you know you're stressed out? And they'll go, well, I don't know. Well, well, if you don't know you're stressed out, how do you know you're stressed out, right? Most of us are stressed out because we feel it in our body. The next question to ask is to simply say, so how strong is that? On a scale of 0 to 10, how strong is that? Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it a 10? Is it a 15? Is it a 5? When you're doing caretaking, it's, it's, it's absolutely uh, a must that we know where that number's at. So we know maybe it's a, maybe it's a child or maybe it's a teenager. Maybe it's a, a somebody that you're working with professionally. Where do, where do you feel that? Where do you feel that stress at in your body? And, and, and then quantify it. How strong is that stress? How, 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 how impactful? And is that going up or is that going down? Uh, it's important to, to understand that. Uh, I might just do a sidebar here with um, several people that, in preparation for tonight, asked me if I was going to talk about how to deal with suicide. And I'm just going to dip into this just a little bit because it fits along the same lines. Um, when you're dealing with people, I've had several people ask me, how do I, how do I deal with people who, who are either threatening suicide or, or feel like they, they, they feel like they're not safe with themselves? How do, I, how do I deal with that? What do I ask them? Well, these are some of the questions. Where do you feel that in your body? Where do you feel that stress at? It's a good way to, to be able to kind of gauge how strong that feeling is. Um, I've learned that there's typically two different approaches for suicide in the clients I've worked with. A lot of clients will come in and say that they're suicidal, they're, they're afraid, they come see me because they're suicidal. And I ask them the question, two different prongs, are you overwhelmed or are you suicidal? Many people will say, I'm, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed, I don't want to be here, I'm just too overwhelmed. And then there are those people who will say, I'm suicidal and this is, I want to commit suicide and this is how I'm going to do it. Um, before I went into counseling, I was, I was afraid to have that conversation. What you will find, people who are truly suicidal, with the exception of, of, of some that are that, that may be completely behind the curtain, that, are, that, that aren't going to tell anybody, but for most people who are struggling with suicidal feelings, they're, they're open to talk about it. Most of the time, it's us that have a problem talking about it. To just simply say, how do you, how, how do you feel about that? Who have you talked about that? And I think one of the powerful things... Gina's talked a little bit about her, her desire with working with mentoring. Um, one of the powerful things is just to offer to them, well, would you call me if you ever feel that way? Would you send me a text? If you, if you, if you ever feel that way, would you, would you just send me a text? It is amazing how powerful that is. When, when you're willing to walk into their world with them, it is really powerful, and the risk of suicide goes way down because they know they're not alone. Sometimes they'll never call. Just simply, they just know that you're there. Sometimes it's also good to just ask permission. Would you give me permission to check in with you? I appreciate you sharing that with me. Now, would you give me permission to call you in a week or tomorrow morning and ask you if you're okay? Don't be afraid to do that. And so, so many times in our world, we're afraid, well, I don't know if I should get involved. Yeah, you should get involved. Sometimes that's all it takes. Sometimes maybe it's you taking them to a counselor. Maybe it's you going in and talking to the, even to the pastoral staff with them. Um, just, just walking with them through that's really powerful. But it all begins with this, this process of having a conversation. And the conversation has to begin with us. I know in the church world I grew up in, even in the church world I pastored, Conversations about mental health just were a very difficult conversation to have. So I really appreciate uh, Pastor Ben and his leadership allowing us to come and, and even talk about this this evening. Because in the church, it's been, a, it's been a kind of a tough thing to talk about. And I want to talk about that tonight for a little bit. Just this intersection of psychology and theology and what that looks like. While we're talking about this, I'm going to give these to Kathleen and have, maybe we can list a few people. Pass those out. We're going to pass out just an activity we're going to do here in just a second. So let me talk about first with how does, how does psychology and theology mix together? Well, I believe that, that God, uh, that all truth is God's truth. If I take this, uh, if I take this pen and I, and I drop it, well, what truth just took place? 
Anyone? Gravity, right? I mean, it's a scientific truth. I believe, that, I believe that's God's truth. It's part of God's law. And I believe psychology is the same way. Psychology is a, is a truth of God. And there's some, very, there's some very basic things when it comes to, to psychology. We've been in the church, we've, we've, uh, we've struggled with that at times. We've struggled with the fact of, you know, how does, how does our faith interact with science? Uh, and psychology is one of those sciences. But all truth is God's truth. Um, I also believe that salvation is, is as much for today as it is for eternity. I believe God wants us to walk in life, and he, God, God wants to walk us, us to walk in joy. In fact, in, Peter's, in Peter it says, to be ready to give an answer for the joy that lies within us. That's God's desire for us. God doesn't, God's not desire for us is not for us to walk in depression. God's desire is not for us to be bound up in that or to, or to, or to live in fear with anxiety. That's not God's desire for us. God's desire for, is for us to have wholeness today. God's desire is for us to walk in, in his joy and his power today. Christ died to save us from our sins and to make us a new creature. And in, in this, he desires to give us this new identity. To, to move us away from shame. To move us away from, from guilt. The gospel of Christ is, as, is at the very core. At the very core of it is the message of redemption. And what that means is that God wants to come in and he wants to do something different. Well, I work with a lot of different people. I work with people who come in who are of, who have, who are of strong faith. And I have people who have come in who have, no, who have no, absolutely no desire when it comes to faith. That, that is not an open part of their life. And, and we work with, with all clients that come in. And, and we see change in a lot of those clients. But the clients who are willing to embrace faith in that change... It becomes really powerful because God, at the very core of faith, God, God's um, redemptive work in us is, is what drives it. That God wants to bring newness to life. He wants to bring wholeness to death. He wants to come in and he wants to, to, to resource us. So tonight, uh, at, the, at the very beginning and working with how do we work through these hard issues of depression and anxiety and suicide and, and even di more difficult things of Maybe issues of psychosis or issues of, uh, that are, are, are uh, really significant mental health issues. At the very, at the very beginning of or at the very uh, heart of that is that God has a desire to be redemptive. That God desires, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've been through, God desires to redeem us. He desires to bring wholeness into our lives. So out of that process, out of that philosophy, is some of the questions that I've run into in, in in my work with people, especially church people, is, so if I'm depressed, is that because of sin in my life? Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. It's possible that there's some conflict within you that is causing some, some uh, issues as far as your, your, your mood and, and how you're dealing with stress in life. It's very possible. Is it always the result of sin? Absolutely not. I think depression and anxiety, those are kind of probably the two most common issues we deal with in, in mental, the mental health world. I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. Some of that just comes down to our makeup. Sometimes it's just how our bodies are wired chemically. I don't struggle so much with depression. Sometimes I, I, I get a little anxious. I was a little anxious tonight at about 4.35 o'clock. Um, some, sometimes we deal with that. But, but it, sometimes it just comes down to our body's makeup. I, I don't struggle with a lot of addictions people struggle with. I don't have real issues with alcohol or gambling or smoking or whatever it might be. But man, I can put cheeseburgers away, let me tell you. And some of that's my disposition to my family. Um, we've carried our weight well in my family. Um, there, we are all wired a certain way. God has created us uniquely. And, and in some families, there is a, a biological propensity towards depression. And what you can see in a lot of families along those lines is some of the behaviors that go along with that. You can track that with, with uh, sometimes with alcoholism. You can track that with suicidality. You can track that with other life-controlling issues that, that coexist with some of those issues. It's, there's, a, there's some pieces to us that are just, are just hardwired that way. Does that mean we're, it's hopeless? Absolutely not. I've seen God just bring incredible joy, even in the midst of 
of that tendency to, to carry some depression, God still brings release and joy and life. There's other things that happen to us that, that set up a stage for depression. I'm a trauma counselor, okay? What that simply means is that we go through difficult things in life. And, and trauma comes in a lot of different packages. One of the most challenging traumas that I work with is car accidents. They're, they're brutal. They're fast, they're sudden, they're, they're loud, they're painful, they're out of control. Um, it's one of the most challenging um, traumas that people go through because it just, it's so fast and so, so hard that it's, it, it creates this trauma. Um, we hear a lot about um, veterans coming back from, from uh, the battlefield. There's definitely trauma there. Um, we live in a time, we live in a culture where there, uh, child abuse is, is very, very prevalent. It's always been there. We are now talking about it more and more, which is, which is phenomenal uh, because it needs to be exposed. But child sexual, childhood sexual abuse is a really big piece of, of trauma that people go through. You, you may be listening tonight, you may be even here tonight, and you, you've experienced some of that. Um, there's, there's depression that comes and anxiety that flows out of that. But there's, light, there's answers for that. There's hope for that. You don't, you're not, that's not a death sentence. God wants to come in and he wants to bring, to bring life into that. We're going to go into that just a little bit more. Another question somebody asks is, uh, is seeking a counselor a sign of, um, or taking medications a sign of lack of faith? I don't see it that way. I see uh, mental health issues very similar to physical issues. In fact, many times there is a physiological component um, where there is, uh, there is a, a, a neurotransmitter or a, a chemical that needs just a little bit out of balance, that just needs some adjustment. Um, is that out of God's will? No, I don't think it is. I, I don't believe that is. Um, some of the people who, who will push that are, are make sure that they take their high blood pressure medication and so there's, there's some conflict on that and people who kind of push that, that line. But I, but I believe that mental health issues are, God has given tremendous wisdom, even in the last 10 or 15 years, the science that has been released. And I believe God releases science. I believe God releases knowledge at the right time. Um, and the science that's being released right now in dealing with these traumas that I've talked about is powerful. There's... there's Pro, uh, protocols that we use right now that I see, I just see life emerge in front of me, and I and literally say to God, "It can't, it can't be that easy." I'm sure on His end, it's all there's a lot more work, but on my end, I'm just sitting watching, just watching life show up on somebody's face. The science that God has released is is so powerful. Is it a lack of faith in going to a doctor or to a counselor? Absolutely not. Now, the question that's asked sometimes is. The, the demonic versus psychology or psychopathology. Um, we read of, of, of individuals in the Bible who experience demonic oppression or um, some level of demonic activity. Um, the demoniac from the Gadarenes that was, uh, the, the spirits were cast into the swine um, is maybe an example of that. Well, where is that, where is that balance there? Well, I think I've worked with both. I think I've worked with people who who um, have had significant mental health issues that showed very troubling and very, um, very difficult symptoms. And I think I've worked with, with uh, individuals who are dealing with some level of demonic activity as well. I've been hit twice during therapy, okay? Both times I was praying for the client under my breath saying, oh God, oh God, you gotta do something here. Both times I got hit. Um, I'm pretty sure there was some demonic stuff going on there. Um, is it always demonic? No. Is there, can there be some demonic things that take place? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so how I have put that together in my mind is this. We live in a fallen world. We live in a, we live in a world that um, bad things happen. And we also live in a world, I believe in, according to my faith, I believe that we have a heaven to gain and we have a hell to shun. I believe there's a good father in heaven that, for us to serve, and I believe we have an enemy of our souls we call Satan. And I believe that enemy of our souls works, works hard against us. We go through life and we experience wounds in our life. We experience difficult things in our life. 
And I believe the enemy comes in so many times into those wounds, and he, he festers that. Um, it's where I think we're part of the, um, uh, the part of the work the enemy comes in to just try to hold us down. The Bible talks about the accuser of the brethren. I, I believe he loves to get into those wounds, those trauma wounds, and just and fester in that and to stir up that pain. I believe that when we begin to, to, to get our eyes on Christ and we begin to understand ourselves, we begin to say, okay, what is really going on in me? What is the, what, where is this coming from? And really begin to take a look at that. That there's something very powerful takes place. When we're, able, when we're willing to open up ourselves and take what is hidden and begin to reveal it in an, a very appropriate way to the right people, I believe we take the power away from that. So many times, as a counselor, the one reason talk therapy is so powerful is because somebody comes into my office that I've never met and I probably will never see outside my office. And they're able to be 100% honest with me about what's going on, about their history, and how their history is impacting them today. And when we take and we turn the light on into that dark area, it's powerful. And again, I think that's biblical. I think that, that a willingness to share, and even the passage in James where it says, uh, um, those who are sick to call on, the el- call on the elders and to confess to one another that they've sinned. I think that's part of just exposing, not saying I'm not going not gonna to be not gonna be controlled by that. It's very powerful when you have somebody, it doesn't have to be a counselor. It can be one of your pastors on staff. It can be a coworker. Just needs to be somebody who will hold it in confidence that they will only tell the people that need to be told. When you're will, able to reveal that, it becomes really powerful. The power, the, the air is let out of the balloon. And it becomes very corrective in it, just in itself, just that talking. Another question that's asked is, why can't I just be healed? Why can't we just pray and this go away? You know, well, we probably say that about our cholesterol and our blood pressure and our, you know, smashed car. We probably say, say that about all that. I believe there are some things that God just simply wants us to walk through. I think, again, Paul's a good example of that. Paul said he prayed three times. They take that thorn in the flesh, and we don't know what that was. We have no idea what that was. But Paul's prayed three times that God would take that away, and every time God said, no, I'm, your sufficiency, your, your dependence needs to be on me. Finally, Paul says, okay, okay, I got it, I got it. There's sometimes we go through where God just says, no, I'm going to have you depend on me me for this i'm going to have you walk through and depend on me and you've got to be good with that you've got to be good with the fact and god resources us during those times one last thing tonight i think a question many times that comes up is what if i can't get over the shame of doing something i did i've done something very difficult i've done something very bad i've done something very hurtful and i can't get over the shame of that I believe, again, a very powerful truth here is when we open that up, there's so much that takes place. What's the first, when you're, if you're out working on something and you've got a hammer and you, and you hit your thumb with your hammer, what is stereotypically the number one response from people when you hit your thumb with the hammer? What is it? Besides maybe saying something, what's the next thing? It's that, right? It's right there, direct pressure, grab and squeeze. And then it's that moment where we say, do I really want to look at that, right? Do I really want to see the damage? But nothing gets done with this. All we do is cut off the circulation. And that's what happens in our world when we have gone through something very difficult. Maybe when we've done something very difficult, maybe we've done something even very painful to somebody else, our first response is this, cover and hide. Direct pressure. And God beckons to us in his word and the culture that he wants the church to be to open that up. Take the pressure off, assess the damage, and move forward. I believe God wants to bring healing. He brings healing in that process when we're able to to acknowledge first to ourselves, then to those around us, just where we're at. 
God will take us through the process. Whatever those consequences or results might be. We're going to pull up here and then I'm going to get into just a couple of activities here. I want to, I want to move us into it. Anybody have any questions maybe that you passed in? Did you have any um, come in at all, Gina? Okay. Maybe we'll just start. Maybe I'll just open it up here, and I don't know if there will be any questions. Is there any questions here tonight, just in this context of, of psychology and theology, of, 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 and dealing then in this environment of, of COVID and some of the stress that you're seeing? And, and, uh... Yes. Um, I have been involved uh, in a lot of, you know, I've been trying not to let this get by with me, but it's been so hard on me. And how many would agree with that? That you're here tonight and say, yeah, I'm in the same boat that I'm just down. I mean, I just, this whole thing with the COVID is just, it's just overwhelming. Um, we would have said if the COVID wasn't taking place and just the election was going on, we would have said the election was getting us down, right? But now we got the COVID and the election going on. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think we're all there to a certain degree. And I think that, um, I, think, I think there's a couple things that, that take that, Keep us healthy. One is to understand just what's going on. What, how is it impacting us? Being able to identify that. I think another thing then is to understand how it's impacting those around us. And I know that we've got social distancing and we've got this, this space we've got to keep. And, but within those contexts, are you, checking, are you checking in with those around you? Are you checking in to just, just asking, how are you doing? I mean, how do you... The, the, I was at the grocery store earlier today and I was, you know, talking through the wall of glass to the grocery store the score lady. And then I just asked her, how are you doing? <laughs> how are you doing with this? I think it's important for us to, to just check in with each other through the plexiglass. Um, and, then, and then be honest when other people ask us that, that question. How are you doing? Don't give our Midwestern answer. Fine. <laughs> fine. Doing Fine. No, be honest. Say, you know, man, this, is, this has been a really tough week. I just, I'm not sleeping good. I'm not, I'm just, I'm struggling. Or last week was really tough. This week's a little better. Just, just being honest with, with where you're at. I think those are some things that even right now in this time that we can, that we can do. For understanding ourselves and then looking out for one another. Being involved. Finding ways to reach out to one another is another powerful piece to get us past ourselves. I know we got these crazy barriers we're working around, but even in the midst of that, you know, a phone call, an email, a text, whatever that might be, just reaching out and saying, hey, how are, how are you doing? How are you doing? Any other questions? Okay, tonight I want to I jump into another activity here tonight to explain a little bit just... Um, from a psychological standpoint, how it works, how our emotions work. And I think this is the most important thing I think I've learned in all of my study and all of my experience. This next, this next piece here, I think, gave me language to be able to talk to people and really to be able to understand how, how emotions work. Um, I've got, would you help me on this end? Would you help me grab, grab those ropes? Kathleen, would you grab on this end? I'm going to have uh, ladies here uh, hold up these ropes. And uh, if you could move up to um, the window of tolerance on the slides. So what I'd like you to do is take and hold the ropes about maybe 20 inches apart. They're about like that. Yep. So um, I want to, I've put it up on the slides as well. And we're just going to use this, this rope as kind of a, an object lesson. So this space in between these two lines is a, an area we're going to call the window of tolerance. Now this window of tolerance is the area in which we can, where we can think and we can feel simultaneously, and that's really important, okay? We need both things. We need to be able to be cognitive, and we need to be able to interact with our, with our, with our uh, environment emotionally. So this space in here, we'll call the window, window of tolerance. Now, in this side, this window, there's, there's lots of movement. Um, as you can see, there's, these, there's those natural sine waves up there on the, on the PowerPoint. So we have this natural mood movement within, the, within these lines. 
If you're flat in here, you're probably dead. Flat line's never really good with that. So, so we have these natural things. We have difficult times that we go through every day. You know, we lose our keys. Well, we're probably down here. And then we find our keys. Well, then we're up here, right? So we have this natural up and down that goes every day. Occasionally, we have things that, that take place that are too much for us, okay? You know, we lose our car, okay? Something, something significant or death of a family member or, or we've been diagnosed with COVID or we just found out that somebody we work with uh, exposed you directly to COVID. Well, then we, we tend to move past these lines. Now, this upper line, uh, this place, this, this upper line is the, is the place where we stop thinking and we just feel. Now, many of us know the term fight or flight. You ever, anybody ever heard those words? So fight or flight is an is a, is a instinctual response. It's a survival response. And it happens when we, get, when, our, when we get aroused, when our sympathetic nervous system kicks in, and we go into just instinct, and we move past this line, and we begin to get, begin to get afraid. And our body prepares for survival. That comes in five different things. You've heard of fight or flight. I'm going to give you a few more. Fight, flight, freeze, submit, and attach. Freeze is really is scared, scared to death. I just lock up. I can't move. I can't make decisions. Submit is it's like a dog that has been beat and kind of cowers when, uh, when somebody goes to raise a hand, even to pet it. It's that, that fear, that paralyzing fear of submission. And then attach is like a toddler that clings. And you see people when they're, when they're scared at that level and they, they cling. It's, a, it's another instinctual response. So what happens is we get activated, our sympathetic system, nervous system kicks in, and we go up into this area, we quit thinking, we're just feeling. Now, if we were to keep going, we'd blow an artery. Okay, so the body begins to, to kick in the parasympathetic system and begins to bring us back down, as you can see up on the slide up front. Now, this upper area up here, this line above the line, we're going to call this hyperarousal. It's anxiety, it's pain, it's panic, panic it's overwhelm, okay? It's that, it's that place, what you would think of as anxiety, that you just can't, your mind is going, you can't slow down. The line below the, the area below the line, so as you come back down through and you go down to what we call hypoarousal or small arousal, it's a, it's a place of shutdown, it's a place of blah, it's a place of of no motivation. It's a place of, of collapse. So you have these two experiences. You have this hyperarousal up here, which is that panic and that anxiety, and this hypoarousal down here. What happens is we have something happen to us, and we tend to come up here, and then our parasympathetic system kicks in, and we drop down below, and then we come back to the middle. That's the natural sine wave of a life. What happens in years like 2020 what happens with people who are struggling with anxiety, what happens with people who have a, tra have a trauma history, is it is up and it's down. It's up and it's down. And it's up and it's down. And their life looks like, uh, 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 uh. That gets so crazy at times that it's just easier to look away. And I am finding so many people this year are finding themselves in that spot where they're just looking away because it's too painful to look at. It's too out of control. There's caregivers here tonight who are working with very difficult cases, very difficult scenarios in nursing homes and in hospitals and clinics, in teachers in schools. And emotionally, it just, it's just too difficult to look at. It's so easy to just, just look away. The problem with that is it's kind of like driving when we look away, bad things happen, okay? We have to be present. We have to be in this area. Now, I'm going to have you guys back up just a little bit. I'm going to move these lines nice and close together. So put the lines about like this. What's happened in, in a year like 2020, or what happens with individuals who have significant trauma history, is their operating space gets so small that it doesn't take much to move them outside the lines. It's just a little nudge, just a word, just a comment, 
just a bad night of sleep, just a bad moment at work, and boom, they're in either hyperarousal or hypoarousal, or they're just or they're just absent. They're looking away. And there's some of you here tonight that are there, that you're just you you may be just living in this hypo this hyperarousal. You're just constantly on edge. And you may be here tonight and you may be living in that hypo arousal where just you can't, can't get out of bed, you can't get done, you can't focus, you can't think, you can't concentrate. And there's some of you here tonight or listening online that, you know, it's too painful to look at. It's just too painful. And, and you don't know what to do. Well, I want to tell you tonight there's, there's hope. Okay? Because uh, come together and let's, let's widen these out. Because there's a way for these lines to be widened out to give you this space in here. Even with the craziness of 2020. I got to tell you, after 2020 is 2021, right? And you know what? I just, it's going to be what it is. We can say 2020, but I just got done listening to a, 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 a book on tape or an um, audible book on, on Ulysses S. Grant. Good grief. The stuff they were going through back then. I mean, it just is what it is. We've got to learn to be able to live in this space. And I believe, thank you ladies for helping with that and you lay that down. I believe God has got a plan for that. God's got a plan through, through his spirit in our lives. But I think he's also got a plan through, through, through the process of understanding ourselves and supporting and resourcing each other. Tonight, what I want to ask you is, is, how, how close, you know, how small is your operating space? How tight have those lines become? How about those that are around you? You know, we're getting calls from kids. I mean, we're getting calls from high school kids by themselves. Their parents don't even know they're calling. They're just calling and saying, help me, I don't know what to do. Calling and saying, I'm suicidal. They're calling and saying, I don't know, I just start crying and I don't know what, I, I don't know what to do. I, there is, there's a fevered pitch right now in our society with the stress that we're in. Um, tonight, I want to tell you that there's hope. One of the very first steps in, in moving into that hope is to tell somebody. Now, there may be somebody sitting next to you tonight here, or you may be somebody sitting next to you at home, or maybe somebody sitting next to you at work. That's safe for you to tell. But the very first thing in this process is just telling somebody, just saying, can I tell you something? Would you let me be transparent with you? Would you let me tell you how I feel? The first step in widening those lines is just talking. That's all it is. And it's really powerful. It's also the scariest step. Because the, the process tends to make us feel like nobody else is going through this. Like we're the only ones that are experiencing this. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people that are experiencing it. And in my experience, the families who are the polished, most polished, that are cleaned up the best, who feel like they have it together, I'm just telling you from my chair, and I will see over 1,400 uh, sessions this year. My practice will, will do about 3,800 counseling sessions this year, between the three of us. And let me tell you, from our chairs, we talk about this pretty regular. When people walk in the door for therapy session, we go, okay, what do we got? And the ones who are polished the most usually are dealing with the biggest stuff. The people who let it all hang out on Facebook and tell everybody what's going on, what do people tell them? Too much information, right? Don't tell us that. I tell you, everybody's dealing with something. I don't care who you are. And that pain of that something you're dealing with seems like the greatest thing you've ever experienced. And everybody feels the same way, but nobody's talking. That dialogue, that conversation needs to take place, and it's, and it's very healthy. Okay, so I passed out some, some uh, sheets to you. Um, Pastor Ben, if you can put that up on the, the next slide up there, for those that are watching online. So what I would like you to do is I want you to look at this piece of paper, and there's a whole bunch of numbers on this paper, and I'm going to give you 45 seconds to do something here. You can do it with a pen. You can do it with your finger. You don't have, to, don't have to circle on it. But what I want you to do 
is in the next 45 seconds, I want you to see, starting with number one, and sequentially going up through two, three, four, five, I want you to see how many numbers you can find in order. You ready? Go. See how many numbers you can find in order. Ten seconds left. Nine, eight, seven, not to put pressure on. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. How many found ten? How many found twenty? How many found anybody find more than twenty? Okay, so twenty is the number. Now what I want you to do, I want you to understand that what I've learned about mental health is mental health is a system. God's des God has designed us as systems. We're, we're, a, we're a whole compilation of systems from breathing and circulation and, and um, neurology. God is, God's put this system together. Well, our mental health is a system as well. I am now going to give you a system that for most of you will double those numbers. Here it is. If you'll throw the next slide up, Ben. What I want you to do now using the four quadrants, I want you to take the piece of paper... I want you to fold that paper in half, and I want you to fold in half the other way. Now what I want you to do is look at those creases, and you end up with four quadrants. And you can do it online right up here, too, as well as we show the next slide. I'm going to ask you now, starting with quadrant in the top left-hand corner, moving to the top right, to the bottom right, to the bottom left, go in that clockwise pattern. Starting with number one in the top left and number two in the top right, 45 seconds, see how high you can get now. Clockwise around the paper. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. How many doubled your number? Okay, quite a few. And all we did, you had the same piece of paper. All we did was draw some lines. We just broke it up into a system. That's all we did. And you doubled your number. We just, we just organized it. So what I'd like to do tonight quickly as we begin to kind of pull this together this evening is I want, to, I want to give you a system for organizing mental health. And this is another piece that has helped me so much in understanding how to work people through the, through the process. Number one thing is this, is there's four quadrants of mental health as, as I've come to understand it. The first quadrant is, where do you feel it in your body? I talked about this quite a bit earlier. Where do you feel depression? Where do you feel anxiety? Where do you feel joy at in your body? Because it goes that way as well. Where do you feel it in your body? If you're a, if you're a healthcare worker, if you're a, a, in any kind of a helping field, and you're under stress, where do you feel that stress at in your body? you got to know that. You have to be aware of that. It's, it, if, you're, if not, you're, you're, you're handicapping yourself. The second thing is this, and this is another very important step, and I think it's a very biblical step, is when you feel that in your body, what do you believe about yourself? Now, there's a foundational truth, and that is, it's not so much what has happened to us, as it is what do we believe about ourselves when it's happening. That's a fundamental truth that we've got to get onto. Because I, and I believe that there's, we don't have time to go into it tonight, but there's, there's so much biblical mooring in that statement. It's not so much what happens to us as it is what we believe about ourselves when it's happening. Negative beliefs. I'm going to have you kick this next slide up. That's going to have a list of, um, go up one more. I think there's, uh, maybe it's one or two more up. There's a list of, um, there we go. So there's a list of, of negative beliefs. It might be I'm powerless, or I'm helpless, or I'm trapped, or it might be I have to be in control, or I'm, a, I'm defective, 
or I'm not good enough, or I'm alone, or I'm not safe, or it might be that I'm inadequate, or it might be that I'm in danger, I'm overwhelmed, or I'm a failure. And these are just, these are just some, simple, some simple statements up there. But I want you to take a moment tonight, just with those that are here tonight and those that are online, take a moment this evening, I want you to think about yourself. In the last day, in the last week, in the last month, when you've been through a difficult situation, maybe finances or health or a co-worker or a family member, what was the worst moment in that, in that exchange? In that moment, where did you feel it in your body? And what words would you put to it? What words would you put on that, on that moment? That is need-to-know information. If you want to move past depression, if you want to move it, if you want to move past anxiety, that you've got to start there. What do you believe about yourself in that moment? What are those negative beliefs? It's so fundamental. From a, from a Christian standpoint, I believe that that's where God wants to create, make you a new creature. That is the thing that he has come to save you from. He has come to release you from that. There's so much shame and there's so much guilt that's tied up in that. What is it that you believe about yourself in that moment? And that very piece right there becomes a very powerful tool to bring life into your body. Most of the times, we can diagnose that by our negative self-talk. You know, most of us may not like to admit it, but most of us probably talk to ourselves, especially when we fail, we talk to ourselves quite a bit, right? Just when you answer or argue with yourself that it becomes more diagnostic, or diagno you can di diagnose that stuff. But most of us tend to say these things to ourselves. And maybe you're an idiot, or you're never going to get it right, or you're always going to be alone, or you're always going to be a failure. That flows out of that negative belief. Be in control. And you've got another person next to him that always feels like they're trapped. Well, that's not a good commendation, let me tell you. And we begin to slam into each other, and we go, why are we, what's going on here? Well, we're, we're interacting with that conflict differently. To understand that we're not each other's enemy. Man, especially in churches, we are not each other's enemy. We just, we're just seeing it differently, and it's okay. It's okay to interact and to experience things differently. One of the most powerful things we can have is just curiosity. Just be curious about the person next to us. How do you see this? Tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you see. Just be curious. Non-judgmental. Just curious. And just find out how they view it. It's fascinating what you can learn when you're willing to just be curious about somebody else. Let me wrap up with this. Foundational principle, it's not so much what has happened to us as what we believe about ourselves when it is happening. So important. Memories are... Our symptoms, um, uh, psychological symptoms, anxiety, depression, so forth, are simply memories that are intruding into today. Um, this is true both for us and for those that are around us. And then finally tonight, I just want to dip in real quickly into this thought of altar and discipleship. <clears throat> those are biblical terms. Those are church terms. Some of you that are listening are not in the, in the church context. Um, and I'll explain how that comes together here. But I believe that change takes place in two ways. Change typically takes place, lasting change has to start with some level of pain. It just does. We none of us usually change, and this is an old saying, goes way back, I don't know who, started, who said it, but it's a powerful saying. I mean, rarely do we change until the pain of staying where we are becomes greater than the pain of changing. Rarely will we work for change in our life until it just really gets really bad to stay where we're at. And it becomes easier to change. It's just, an, it's just a foundational fact. Very few people change in their life. A lot of people start changing. Very few people follow through with it. So we go through this emotional experience that forces us into making a decision about change. In, in the church realm, that might be the altar. It might be something that God speaks to us you know, through, a, through a minister or through the Bible or through the Spirit. God speaks something through us. It might be through a doctor that says, yeah, you only got two months to live if you don't change something. Or you just may only have two months to live. 
It may be through a banker that says, yeah, I'm going to foreclose on your house, your business, or whatever that might be. It might be a child that comes to us and says, um, you know, I've chosen to live an alternate lifestyle, and I don't, I don't care what you think about it. Or we run into these things that, well, we weren't supposed to run into. And we don't know what to do with it, other than the fact that the moment just became so painful. We, we've got to do something. That's what I call an alter experience. It's this moment where, where life just becomes out of control, unpredictable. Alters are events which generate passion for change. They're tremendous things. It's that, it's that energy to, to, I'm going to do this. Discipleship, on the other hand, is carrying that out. And I say discipleship, that's a, that's a, that's a church term, but discipleship is very simply um, walking out change over time. Okay, It's getting education. It's getting support. It's being in relationships that are going to help support us do that. Alters without discipleship typically are just an emotional experience that just kind of fizzle out eventually. Man, how many diets have I started, right? Man, I, had, I just had the motivation. I had to you know, I see myself in the mirror or I see myself in a picture and I think, yeah, Monday I'm doing this. And the, by, and by Wednesday it's like, ah, the heck with it, right? Alters are those moments where we, we have this emotional experience, but if we don't follow through, it fizzles out. On the other hand, if somebody talks you into change, discipleship without an altar, it becomes legalism or legalistic. And it doesn't, change, it doesn't last either. We tend to, we tend to be, have contempt or the person trying to get us to do it. Those two things have to go hand in hand. We go through these experiences and then we got to get help at the same time. When those two things come together, it becomes really powerful. And I believe that the church is set up beautifully for that, for that purpose. Where we're able to confront one another with the word of God. We're able to confront one another with, with, with issues of, of life and of change and of relationship. And then we're also willing to walk that out with one another. I also believe it's set up beautifully within caregiving. Whether you're a worker in a nursing home or whether you're a counselor, whether you're a doctor or somebody in the medical field or a teacher... To be able to see people struggling with things and, and be able to say, well, let's make a plan and let's do this together. But both have to, both have to go hand in hand. It's when change becomes the most lasting, when change becomes the most stable. Lastly tonight, was that my third lastly? This is my last lastly. What do we do when we just don't know what to do? Because man, how many times are we in that boat right now? I think as believers, and, I, and even as caregivers, and as whatever that might be, right now we need to reflect hope. And as believers, we have this ability to reflect, to literally be, just to be a mirror and just reflect the hope of God. I mean, there's, there's not any answers for some of this. There just, isn't, there just isn't any good answer to explain why that took place. And sometimes we just have to say, I don't know. I don't know. But we'll get through this. There's a way through this. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be quick. But there's a way through this. And reflect hope. Some of you who are online or in the professions when, where the situations are hopeless. As caregivers, we've got to start there just reflecting hope. As the body of Christ, not only here at Northridge, but outside these walls, body of Christ in Mitchell, why well, we should be re just beacons of hope. We should be reflecting what God has done for us. And lastly, knowing when to get help. I think that a lot of us have resources around us. We've got churches. There's a wonderful church here with a wonderful staff. And they're equipped to do so much. And I think those 
those resources around us. Maybe it's an employer, or maybe it's a counselor on staff, or maybe it's a, somebody at work, that, that, a supervisor that you can talk to. It starts with just, just talking. When do we get further help? It's when, when you see that their care, that caregiver may be getting a little overwhelmed. If you're a caregiver and, and you're feeling like you just don't have any answers, it may be a time to refer and say, okay, there's, let's look at some other options in the community. I think one of the biggest things, I think, in that question of when, to get, when do you get help, when do you refer into a medical doctor or into a counselor such as myself or a social worker, is safety. Whenever there's a safety or security issue, somebody's, somebody's threatening suicide and they've got a plan. Somebody's threatening suicide and, they're, and they're, you can tell that they're underwater. It's time to refer. It's time to get some other people in. And don't tell them you need to go talk to somebody. Say, would you come with me? I want to I go talk to somebody with you. Don't send them. Go with them. Whenever it comes to safety and security, it's, it's, time to, it's time to get help. When you are getting overwhelmed yourself, when you can feel that heaviness, and it's time to get help. It's time to refer on. And there's people that, that can help that through the church here, um, medical doctors, counselors in the community. We've got great counselors across the community. Tonight as we close, I'm going to have Pastor Ben come up. I just want to ask you here tonight. Lots of different reasons why people come to things like this. Things they're experiencing. Maybe just, just interested or, or curious. Maybe things going on around your home or work or community. But tonight, I want to ask you, if you're here tonight and you're, and you're underwater, I've talked shop a little bit tonight. I love talking counseling. But beyond that, I love talking the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. You may be online tonight and you're just, you're frightened. You don't know what to do. You may, you may have had religion or Christianity or faith somewhere in your life. Well, let me tell you, there's an answer through faith tonight. If you're here tonight and you feel, you feel hopeless tonight, I want to tell you, your hope starts in Christ. That's where true wisdom comes in. James says, if any man lacketh wisdom, just let him ask of God. God will answer liberally. Tonight, if you're here and you're in that spot, I'm going to have Pastor Ben close here tonight, and he's just going to pray with you tonight. That when you walk out these doors tonight, there'll just be this sense of anticipation. If you're online tonight, that wherever you're at, that you would just sense the presence of God in your place, that there's hope. I want to thank you for coming tonight. I want to thank you for being involved this evening. I encourage you to reach out to those around you because that's where it becomes powerful. Pastor Ben. Here at Northridge, we've been in a series of the book of Jonah. If you are with us a couple Sundays ago, we talked about how Jonah really had given up. He told them to throw him in the water. All these other sailors, they're in this life-threatening situation, and they did. And that's not when the fish came. He started to sink. In chapter 2, we find in his prayer that he talked about the waters closing in around him, you know, sinking in, and then the weeds wrapping around his head. And I think that that really gives words to the way we feel sometimes. But do not forget for one second that in that moment, he called out to God and God heard him. And what we see throughout the book of Jonah is that this, this heart change that takes place where we realize God is the one who rescues us from our situation. And that rescue might come in a conversation with someone that we care about or trust. It might be in some measure of therapy. It might be whatever that God uses to help us realize who he is and who we are in him starts to lead to freedom and freedom to experience living in that area of self-regulation. We're just not meant to live life alone. We're not meant to be isolated. We are meant to be in relationship with others. And yet, it seems like the problems we have take us into a pit or over the edge or whatever picture you want to use. And so tonight, I just want to um, remind you about what God did for Jonah. 
He rescued him. The end of Jonah chapter 2, salvation belongs to the Lord. And we need to be reminded of that together. We need to testify to these things. We need to share and let one another know that uh, we need to get new perspective and, and have, have help from the Lord and from our brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, that help that comes in Christ is so much better than just some self-help. It's so much better, friends. It's, it's transformational, and it leads to the discipleship, that heart change that Jonathan referred to, and then the discipleship that follows, the commitment that follows heart change. True heart change is always followed by commitment. Where we've realized we have to walk in a different direction, a different path. And that is uh, our heart for you. So I want to just lead you in prayer tonight as we close. And uh, here's my challenge. If you're helping someone, think of a way to try to draw them out. What question could you ask that would just bring them to a place of vulnerability where they know they, they, that they can trust you? If you're the person who needs to be drawn out, let someone you know that you trust that you need to talk. And if you're hearing someone, someone comes to you and you hear the story and you realize that there's a place of a danger, then go with them. Okay? You've got all that? <laughs> you can handle it, I'm sure. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much for being led and, and serving us in the Lord in this. So let's pray together. Dear Lord, I... I am humbled again here before you in your presence and before my friends and, and even people I don't know yet well, Lord. And I just see how your spirit has been moving in preparing us for tonight. Others who are here, Lord, uh, online joining us. Uh, Father, just wherever they are at, I, I pray for this challenge to reach their hearts too, that they would understand that there is an answer for their heartfelt need for help, and it comes directly from you, first and foremost, Lord. And then I just pray that whatever uh, altar moment, whatever heart change occurs, that it would lead to steps of discipleship, that it would lead, lead to steps of growth and ways of living in, in balance, and emotionally and spiritually, and physically, so many different aspects to the, the beautiful way you've created us as your children. So, Lord, as we go from here, let us not stay stuck. Let us move forward. And, uh, Father, I just pray your blessing on every person that's been able to be a part of uh, tonight's gathering. And we trust you, Lord. We love you. We pray that you lead us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.